Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Social life, Irene Silverman was enjoying a festive dinner with two friends in the kitchen of her Beau Arts mansion on the Upper East Side on July 4th, 1998. When the 82-year-old woman looked up at the closed-circuit security monitors on her wall, she grew agitated. There was her newest tenant ducking his face from the camera. Again! The wealthy widow regretted renting an apartment in her luxury building to the young man. A week after his arrival, she became suspicious of his secretive behavior and asked him to leave. But he refused. Next, she cut the phone service to his apartment, but he would not budge. Silverman's friends worried about her safety and Silverman's staff voiced their concerns about her staying there alone while they were off for the holiday. But Silverman was not easily intimidated. She felt everything would be resolved that coming Monday morning, July 6th, the day her business manager was going to serve the difficult tenant an eviction notice. But the feisty widow did not understand what she was up against. And within hours, Irene Silverman would vanish off the face of the earth. We get support from June's Journey. Escape to a bygone age of mystery, danger, and romance as you immerse yourself in the world of June's Journey. Play as June Parker and investigate beautifully detailed scenes of the 1920s while uncovering the mystery of her sister's murder. With hundreds of mind-teasing puzzles, the next clue is always within reach. I'm always excited to complete each chapter to see where the storyline takes me. It's immersing and engaging, but still a great way to relax at the end of the day. Discover your inner detective when you download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. This holiday season, get yourself the gift you really want. A smile you'll love. Order your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95 at Byte.com. Byte Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer payment plans, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA or FSA. With Byte, you'll be smiling big at all the holiday parties this year. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Be confident. Be you. With Byte. From Wondery and Treefort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the third season of Killer Psyche. I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is The Kimes, part one. Irene Silverman was born in 1917 in New Orleans to a seamstress mother and a fishmonger father who abandoned the family when she was 16. Her mother invested every spare cent in ballet lessons, eventually taking Irene to New York City and enrolling her in a famed ballet studio there. They struggled to survive despite her mother sewing costumes in exchange for tuition. 
At five foot tall, Irene was too petite to become a premier ballerina, but talented enough to secure a spot in the famed Radio City Music Hall Corps de Ballet. The job opened doors to social engagements where she met influential New Yorkers. In 1941, she married one of her admirers, Sam Silverman, a wealthy mortgage broker. After they wed, Irene threw herself into becoming a society hostess. The couple owned homes in New York, Paris, Athens, and Honolulu. They held elegant dinner parties attended by bankers and dignitaries, and their art-filled 19th century townhouse at 20 East 65th Street, steps from Central Park, became a Manhattan social destination. When Irene's husband died in 1980, she scaled back her large formal events to smaller affairs. Her guest list grew more eclectic. The Wall Street and ambassador types now mingled with stars from Broadway and fashion, as well as professors, her butcher, and her carpenter. She also divided up the six-story, $7 million townhouse into small luxury apartments and charged over $6,000 a month for rent. Because Irene shared meals and socialized with her tenants, she carefully selected them based on their interesting lives as much as their ability to pay. Her rentals even attracted celebrities like singer Shaka Khan and actor Daniel Day-Lewis. In April 1998, Irene received a call from a woman named Eva Guerrero who said she learned about the home from an insurance broker in the moneyed enclave Palm Beach, Florida. Guerrero wanted to rent an apartment for her boss, 24-year-old Mexican fashion designer named Manny Guerin, who was relocating to New York. When Guerin arrived a few weeks later in mid-June for Silverman's required tenant interview, he was well-dressed, polite, and he was handsome. He mentioned a few people they knew in common, but he did not have the particular ID and personal references normally required because, he said, his possessions were still in transit. However, he presented her with $6,000 in cash for rent, which persuaded Silverman to make an exception. Irene agreed to let him rent apartment 1B on the condition that he produce his documents the next day. But Manny Guerin failed to produce those documents the next day. Or ever. He avoided all contact with Silverman, but she frequently caught him eavesdropping outside her office door. He also steered clear of the staff, yet tried to befriend the longtime butler, offering him employment and asking him for private tours of Irene's townhouse. When pressed by Irene, Manny responded to questions with monosyllabic answers. The maids told Irene that Garin rekeyed his door and installed a bolt lock so they could not enter his apartment to clean. But the staff could see that he was watching them through the peephole when they were in the hallway. The only person he opened his door for was a woman in her early 60s who visited daily. Silverman became convinced Manny Guerin was a drug dealer. On July 5th, Silverman, dressed in a housecoat and slippers, asked the only maid working that weekend to walk her dog on the rooftop garden. It was 11.30 in the morning. Then she went into her room and spoke with a friend on the phone until about 11.45. Around 4 p.m., the maid noticed the house was eerily quiet. 
the wealthy widow never left the house unaccompanied or without telling Steph, but she was nowhere to be found. Alarmed, the maid contacted Silverman's business manager, and he called the police. An NYPD detective arrived and called for assistance to search the building. There was no blood, no signs of an accident, or even a struggle. Irene Silverman was just gone. A few blocks from where officers were combing through Silverman's townhouse that evening, an FBI and NYPD task force was arresting two fugitives on a Utah warrant outside a Manhattan hotel. 63-year-old Sante Kimes and her 23-year-old son, Kenny, were wanted on a stolen check charge, theft of a mobile home, as well as for questioning in the murder of a Los Angeles businessman. The FBI had been on their heels for months. As she was handcuffed, Sante Kimes tried to distance herself from a black final bag she was carrying. She claimed it belonged to a friend, then inexplicably blurted out, Irene Silverman is a friend of mine. She's a ballerina. She lets me hold on to her papers and documents. The bag contained lots of papers and documents. In fact, Inside were Irene Silverman's passports, checkbook, social security card, and photocopies of her American Express and Blue Cross cards. It also contained $10,580 in cash. Kenny Kimes also had credit cards belonging to Silverman and a set of keys to her townhouse. At the time of the Kimes' arrest, the task force had no idea who Irene Silverman was, nor that another NYPD detective was actively searching for her. The Kimes' were taken to a Manhattan police station and questioned in separate rooms. But Kenny called out to his mother through an adjoining wall to ask her how he should answer questions. When he learned they had been arrested for writing a $14,800 bad check to a car dealership in Cedar City, Utah, Kenny seemed relieved. He wanted to go to court immediately and clear things up. The next day, July 6th, the NYPD cordoned off the sidewalk in front of Irene Silverman's townhouse. During interviews with the staff, Detectives learned about Manny Guerin, the sketchy tenant about to get evicted. They found Guerin's apartment cleared out, except for some large garbage bags and a roll of duct tape. The NYPD issued a missing person alert with Silverman's photo alongside a photo fit image of Manny Guerin. A photo fit is a method of combining photographs of facial features like nose, eyes, hair, to a composite picture of a face from a witness description. Later that evening, a sharp-eyed NYPD officer saw a news story about Silverman's disappearance. He recognized the person of interest photo fit and called the lead detective to tell him that Guerin was already in custody. He knew because he was working on a check fraud case with the FBI and arrested the man and his mother the day Silverman disappeared. But he said the suspect's name was not Manny Guerin. His name was Kenny Kimes. Within hours, the NYPD realized the mother and son team in custody were two of the most wanted criminals in the entire country. Police in Utah and Florida had been investigating them for check fraud and auto theft. Police in Nevada were after them for suspected arson and insurance fraud. 
Los Angeles police wanted them for questioning in the murder of a 63-year-old businessman whose body was found in a dumpster near the L.A. International Airport. And police in the Bahamas were looking for them in connection with the September 1996 disappearance of a 48-year-old banker there. That banker was last seen having dinner and then leaving the restaurant with the Kimes. Two days after the Kimes' arrest, police used a claim ticket from Kenny's pocket to locate their car in a nearby parking garage. Inside, they found 9mm and 22 caliber loaded pistols, boxes of ammunition, an empty stun gun box, several wigs, masks, plastic handcuffs, a knife, pepper spray, $30,000 in cash, two medical syringes, and a vial of rofenol, a tranquilizer known as the date rate drug Rufi. Police also found eight mini cassette tapes with recordings of Irene Silverman's phone calls. On one, an alleged Las Vegas casino manager who sounded a lot like Sante Kimes tried to coax Silverman's social security number from her to collect a free hotel stay. Additionally, there were blank social security cards, power of attorney forms, real estate transfer forms, and several pages where someone had been practicing Irene Silverman's signature. There was also a box of documents with the names of Kimes' associates, including one of the murdered Los Angeles businessman. Incredibly, they also recovered 13 notebooks with Sante's very detailed lists and plans of actions. In my line of work, we call that a confession. While investigators were starting to get an idea of what might have happened to Irene Silverman, they still did not have proof as to why the Kimeses targeted her. Sante and Kenny Kimes, they weren't talking. After she was arrested, police found a claim check for a bag that Sante had checked at the Plaza Hotel Concierge on July 5th. Sante was not a guest at the hotel, but the bellhop who accepted it assumed she was. Sante got the private investigators working for her lawyers to collect the bag before the police could. The district attorney served the private investigator a subpoena and finally recovered the bag. In it, they found a crucial piece of evidence, a forged deed transferring Silverman's $7 million townhome to the Atlantis Corporation, a shell corporation controlled by, guess who, the Kimes. They traced the paper trail of the corporation to a bank in Aruba where the Kimes had done business. Investigators spent the next several months unraveling the elaborate mother-son grift in hopes of finding Silverman or her body. Police traveled to five states and two countries and interviewed over 400 witnesses to build their case. They learned that the Kimes' plot to steal Silverman's townhouse was hatched after Sante met a man who told her all about a wealthy, eccentric widow who had a luxury boarding house in Manhattan. Using another alias, Sante, in Florida at the time, called a title company to inquire about the terms of the deed to the East 65th Street property. Sante and her son then traveled to New York, paid cash for a copy of the deed to Silverman's home, then requested the forms necessary for a property transfer. Sante moved quickly. Weeks after her first inquiry about the title, she called a pizza delivery man she knew in Las Vegas named Stanley Patterson. Sante told him to get on a plane to New York because she had a building she wanted him to manage. 
Patterson did odd jobs for Sante, including buying guns for her, something she could not do for herself because she was a convicted felon. But the FBI, who had been trying to track down Sante, found out and arrested Patterson. In exchange for reduced charges, Patterson became a confidential informant for the FBI. The FBI instructed him to get on the plane bound for New York and meet Sante. While this was happening, Sante tried to get the property transfer documents notarized, eventually impersonating Silverman and forging her signature to get it done. Three days after the transfer was complete, on July 5th, sometime between 11.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m., Kenny and Sante Kimes killed Irene Silverman in her home and removed her body from the building. Later that same day, the FBI and NYPD, still unaware about the connection to Irene Silverman, arranged for Stanley Patterson to meet the Kimeses outside Sante's Manhattan Hotel at 7 p.m. And that is where they arrested the mother and son grifters. Audible is the home of storytelling. Access titles in every genre and new formats like podcast, the words, plus music series, and theatrical performances, all in one app. The newly included selection of titles makes Audible membership so much more valuable and gives all members a chance to discover new favorites. And that includes my own book, Special Agent, My Life on the Front Lines in the FBI. Lots of great stories in there, including investigating the Tylenol murders and the Unabomber. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes with the world's best? Easily hundreds to thousands of dollars, but with a masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list. Because both of you can learn from the best to become your best, from leadership to effective communication to cooking. It's like masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. This holiday season, give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash Wondery. Right now, you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash Wondery. Masterclass.com slash Wondery. Offer terms apply. Sante Kimes was born Sante Singers in Oklahoma City on July 24, 1934, during the height of the Depression. She was the third of four children. Her mother, Mary, was of Dutch descent, and her father, a touring magician, immigrated to America from India. He later worked as an herb doctor and a farmer, but he was gone from her life by the time Sante was six years old. In some accounts, he abandoned the family in Oklahoma when she was three. In others, he died of a heart attack when she was six. And Sante said to support her and her siblings, her mother resorted to cleaning homes and prostitution. Sante's younger sister told the media that Sante had an incestuous relationship with their teenage brother. It stopped when the brother left home. She also described Sante as a bully who forced her to hold lit matches between her fingers and toes. She also accused Sante of tying up their neighbor's goats and dogs and sticking hat pins in their hindquarters. Animal torture in a child's youth is an excellent predictor of future bad acts, bad acts towards other humans. 
looks to me, based on this information, Sante Kimes was a budding, sadistic psychopath. But we'll get to more about her later. By the time Sante was about 11 or 12, she, her mother, and younger sister were living in Studio City, California. A local couple who owned a movie theater noticed Sante roaming the streets unsupervised and offered to support her. When Sante was 13, the woman asked Mary Singers if her relatives, a childless couple living in Carson City, Nevada, could adopt Sante. Sante's mother agreed. Sante was legally adopted by Colonel Edwin Chambers, a high-ranking officer in the local National Guard, and his wife, Mary, in 1947. They doted on Sante, giving her nice clothes and ski trips at nearby Lake Tahoe. During high school, Sante changed her name to Sandy Chambers and started wearing makeup to lighten her skin. She dated a real standout athlete, and she received top grades. After graduating in 1952, Sante moved to Sacramento and found clerical work. That same year, she married a young Army recruit named Lee Powers that she had just met. But when Powers could not provide the lifestyle that she aspired to, Sante divorced him less than a year later. She then went to college to study journalism before returning to Sacramento and marrying her high school sweetheart who was enjoying success as a small builder. Their relationship, though, was volatile. Sante spent money recklessly and well beyond her husband's income. She also had affairs with some of his clients and was known to physically assault him when she became angry. Early in their marriage, a home he built mysteriously went up in flames. But rather than use the insurance payout to rebuild the home, she spent it. Sante was later arrested for the first time for shoplifting. In 1962, Sante gave birth to her first child, a son, Kent. In spite of her infidelities, exorbitant spending, and habitual shoplifting, her husband remained enamored with her. But Sante eventually divorced him and moved with their son to Palm Springs. Why there? Sante was in search of a millionaire husband. And in 1971, she found him. That would definitely be the place to go to find a rich guy. Palm Springs was the playground of the rich and famous on the West Coast. She knew what she wanted, and she also knew she would find him there. Long before Sante was a killer, she was a con artist. Just a cheap con artist. But... She was pretty good. So what is a con artist? Well, it is someone that their big deal is manipulating other people. What is manipulation? Well, just to be clear, when I say manipulation, this is what I mean. An attempt to get something of value from another person by sneaky means, not direct, not, hey, I really like that watch, can I have it? More like a trick. They'll come up with a trick to figure out how to get that watch off your wrist and onto their wrist. Through deception, they fool people into believing that they can, well, in many cases, make easy money. The get-rich-quick scheme. But you know who gets rich? The con artist. And the victim ends up with nothing. Sante had taken a job at Millionaire Magazine in order to meet wealthy men. She hooked up with one of the magazine's subjects, 53-year-old Kenneth Kimes Sr., 
a divorced motel magnate who was worth about $20 million. In the article, Kimes Sr. spoke openly about his failed marriage and costly, acrimonious divorce. He swore he would never marry again. Like many men, Kimes was attracted to Sante's physical beauty. She bore a striking resemblance to Elizabeth Taylor. She wore black beehive or teased bouffant wigs like the movie star did and powdered her face to lighten her skin. Sante enchanted Kenneth Kimes Sr. She read that his favorite color was white. And so, she permanently adopted an all-white, monochromatic wardrobe. She flattered and pampered him, giving him daily facials and massages. Before Sante, Kimes was not known to be a drinker, but Sante plied him with alcohol for the rest of his life. Gee, I wonder why she did that. She also provided Kimes with a lot of excitement. Using her father's East Indian heritage, Sante switched back to her maiden name and invented an ambassador title for Kimes that had some obscure connection to the Indian embassy. She flaunted the phony title to secure better service at restaurants, stores, hotels, airlines, and businesses. According to Kathy Scott, author of The Crime Book, the con artist crimes can be varied, and Sante certainly were, but the one thing they all have in common is the power of persuasion to take advantage of unsuspecting people. The confidence game, as scam artistry is called, exploits people's trust. How can that happen? It happens to smart people. How is it that smart people end up giving over something on trust? Well, human nature is on the side of the con artist, the trickster. What do I mean by human nature being on the side of the con artist? Well, because they often prey on people's trust and their propensity for believing what they wish was true. For example, if you invest $100 in my company next week because of all these wonderful things that are happening, I'll be able to pay you back $1,000. The victim wants that to be true. So, human nature, they write the check or they give the person the cash. Sante devised other schemes as well, including how to make money from the 1976 bicentennial of the American Revolution by selling posters and bumper stickers. She obtained official bicentennial commission letterhead and wrote press releases in which she extolled Kenneth as the, quote, honorary bicentennial ambassador of the United States of America. She arranged for Kenneth to give speeches at schools and even the Pasadena Rose Bowl Parade about bicentennial activities. On one occasion, the couple went to Washington, D.C., and using their phony ambassador title, they crashed four different A-list parties in one night. This included one at the presidential guest home known as Blair House, where an event was thrown by Vice President Gerald Ford and his wife, Betty. An alarmed Secret Service agent realized there were uninvited guests chatting with the Fords, and he kicked them out. The next day, D.C. newspapers laughed about the imposters who had duped the Secret Service. Not that Sante needed anything to puff up her ego, but that would certainly do it. So what is the psychology of the con? 
As you know, that's my favorite question regarding the bad guys, and in this case, the bad girls, that we present on Killer Psyche. The why behind their criminal behavior. According to Kathy Scott, as well as other researchers, the psychology of the con can be seen in their personality flaws, and they are very serious flaws at that. While living with Kime Sr., Sante filed dozens of insurance claims for non-existent stolen furnishings or for fire damage. Their Honolulu home burned down twice. After the first fire, the insurance company payout was deemed too meager by Sante, so she went to the home of the senior company executive in New York and threatened his children. Did he call the police and have her arrested? No. Instead, the company gave Sante the money she was looking for. Successful grifters, which is another term for them, exhibit three similar personality characteristics. Psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism which have been referred to by psychologists as the dark personality traits. We've talked about this in other episodes of Killer Psyche. When their Hawaiian home burned a second time 12 years later, investigators uncovered evidence of arson provided by a tipster who oddly later went missing. While Sante convinced Kenneth Kimes to buy homes in Las Vegas, Santa Barbara, Honolulu, and the Bahamas, he still never gave her access to any of his bank accounts or investments. What does that tell you? Clearly, he didn't trust her as far as he could throw her. So, in order to secure her husband's fortune and her future, Sante produced an heir. On March 24, 1975, Kenneth Kimes Jr., or Kenny, was born in Los Angeles. Sante was almost 41 years old. Not surprisingly, Kenny was cared for by nannies. As he grew, Sante did not permit him to have playmates or attend school. Instead, he was tutored at home. She told neighborhood mothers that her son had tested in the genius range, and she did not want him mingling with other children, though she relented and let him have playdates with the children she selected. Sante saw the biggest threat between her and Kenneth Kime Sr.'s fortune was his two adult children, his elderly mother and his sister. So she invented a story that, quote, the creeps, as she called them, were plotting to kidnap Kenny. This also provided further justification for placing security locks and deadbolts on all of the bedroom doors in her houses. She said it was to keep Kenny safe from the creeps. Now, mind you, this was all in her head. There was never any evidence of a possible kidnapping. But locking up all her homes served to lock up her maids, many of whom were tricked by Sante into coming to the United States from Mexico. Once they were employed, and I use the term loosely, the young women were forced to work up to 15 hours a day, seven days a week, with little or no pay. She often hit them with coat hangers, burned them with irons or boiling water, pulled their hair and slapped and kicked them when she was displeased with their work. While traveling again to the nation's capital, Sante stole a woman's $6,500 mink coat from a hotel bar. Other patrons witnessed Sante take the coat off the back of a chair, 
slip it on, and then put her own full-length fur coat on top of it before leaving the bar. You know what that is? That is confidence and narcissism on steroids. She wouldn't have done it if she didn't think she could get away with it. And by this time in Sante's life, she'd been getting away with a lot. Being a psychopath allows con artists to swindle people out of their money without feeling any remorse or guilt. When you think about it, a person has to be rather heartless to swindle an elderly or disabled person out of their money. But they do it and they have no guilt. Another thing most swindlers have in common is their egos, also known as narcissism. You've heard me say it before. Every narcissist needs a mirror. And for the con artist, their victim is their mirror. And every time they succeed, that success, which could be the property they stole or the bank account they raided or forged document they passed off successfully, every time they get away with it, it reinforces their desire to do it again and again and again. But there's another reason why they do it again. Psychopaths do not learn from their mistakes. They can go to prison for 10 years for something, get out, and it won't be long before they do the very same thing again. When police arrived to question Sante and her husband in their hotel suite, they noticed an open window even though temperatures were near freezing. Sante had tossed the pilfered coat out the window where it landed on an awning. Sante was charged with felony theft and Kenneth, a lesser charge for taking a man's coat. Why did they do that? They had money galore. They could have bought the coats they wanted. I think they did it for the thrill. They spent the next five years avoiding court dates. Finally, at her July 1985 trial, Sante was found guilty of grand larceny. Did she go to prison? No, she fled. And that resulted in a federal fugitive warrant being issued for her arrest. But it was not the coat theft that finally landed Sante Kimes in jail. The FBI tracked Sante and Kenneth to La Jolla, California, where they had rented a condo under an alias. It was there Sante was arrested on charges of slavery and indentured servitude. As important as psychopathy is Machiavellianism, and that is a really unhealthy, dare I say, dangerous trait that describes their ability to be cunning and manipulative and a willingness to do whatever they have to do to gain power. In this case, power over another individual. People with this particular trait, Machiavellianism, see other people as an ends to a means for them to achieve their goals, usually bad goals. And being ruthless and amoral is no problem if that's what it takes to accomplish their goal. Another way to say that is they are bad to the bone. But let's take an even deeper dive into the dark triad. First and foremost, if you ever find yourself involved with someone like this, and it can be a man or a woman, this is what I want you to do. Run like the wind. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Just run, run, run. Why do I say that? Well, to be blunt, people with this personality trait have difficulty engaging in warm, loving, non-selfish behaviors, which is pretty much essential in healthy relationships. So if you engage with this type of person, good luck. You are going to need it. We're talking about the dark triad. I call that a personality disaster. And it encompasses all three of those malevolent features. 
psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism. It's bad news. According to psychologists Palhos and Williams, who developed the dark triad concept in 2002, quote, people with these traits tend to be callous and manipulative, willing to do or say practically anything to get their way. They have an inflated view of themselves and are often shameless about self-promotion. These individuals are likely to be impulsive and may engage in dangerous behavior, in some cases, even committing crimes without any regard for how their actions affect others. Hmm, sound like anyone we've been talking about? Let's break it down even further. Why is psychopathy a component of the dark triad? Most researchers consider psychopathy to be the darkest component of the dark triad insofar as psychopaths generally cause more harm to individuals and to society than do narcissists. Let's not forget, though, the term psychopath is not a mental health diagnosis. The disorder that most closely represents it in the DSM is antisocial personality disorder. And when you look at those three words together, it kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? So if you're thinking to yourself, hey, Candace, you describe a lot of killers featured on Killer Psyche as psychopaths or sociopaths. Well, you're right, I do. Why? Easy answer. Most killers that make it through to the finals of Killer Psyche actually are psychopaths. And why is that? Well, to commit premeditated murder for one's own personal financial gain, one has to be without remorse, and that's the hallmark of a psychopath. And here's your prescription. I know just the pharmacy to get this filled. Who are you? A pharmacy benefit manager. A middleman your insurer uses to decide which medicines you can get, what you pay, and sometimes even which pharmacy you should go to. Why can't I go to a pharmacy in my neighborhood? Because I make more money when you go to a pharmacy I own. (laughs) No one should stand between you and your medicine. Visit phrma.org slash middleman to learn more. Paid for by Pharma. So what is Machiavellianism besides a difficult word to pronounce? Well, it is not a mental health diagnosis either. Rather, it's a personality trait describing a manipulative individual who deceives and tricks others to achieve their goals. For this type of person, and we've all met them, manipulating is way more fun for them than simply being straightforward. It makes them feel like they are pulling one over on the stupid listener. And that in turn makes them take pride in themselves for being so much wiser and smarter than anyone else in the room, especially their victim. The term is based on the political philosophy of the 16th century writer, Niccolo Machiavelli, who believed the end always justified the means if one is to obtain and hold on to power. Some evidence suggests that of the three dark traits, Machiavellianism is most closely tied to high intelligence. If a psychologist refers to someone as high Mac, that means they behave in a highly manipulative manner. Not good, by the way. Lastly, Let's look at narcissism and how it is related to the dark triad. This component of the dark triad is characterized by excessive self-regard, a heightened arrogance, a disregard for those they hurt, taking pleasure in the suffering they cause others, also known as sadism. And if all that weren't enough, they tend to be paranoid Well, it is true that most narcissistic people can be charming as well as difficult and frustrating, 
The true dyed-in-the-wool primary narcissist, aka the malignant narcissist, is a very unfortunate combo of both narcissistic and antisocial personality disorders. And they can become emotionally abusive and violent when they believe they are not given their due. Yikes! Bar the door and don't let this guy in. Yes, most of them are men. But wait, there's more. Psychologists call it the D or the dark factor of personality. So what does that mean? Well, recently, researchers have begun to hypothesize that a single core factor classified as D may underlie many different negative traits, including those in the dark triad, as well as, hold on to your hat, sadism, entitlement, and others. D denotes a tendency to maximize one's own desires at the expense of other people. In short, if someone is afflicted with the dark triad, it is very easy for them to commit crimes, minor and major, and killing a sweet little old lady and taking all of her stuff is no trouble at all. Please join us next week for part two of The Kimes, and I guarantee that it will be one of the stranger episodes that we have done. If you like our show, please give us a rating and review. Follow Killer Psyche on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. By supporting them, you help us offer the show for free. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a survey at Wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Additional writing and director of research is Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Wachnin, and the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are myself, Candace DeLong, Kelly Garner, and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Hey, I'm Marisha. And I'm Brooke. And we're the hosts of Wondery's podcast, Even the Rich, where we bring you absolutely true and absolutely shocking stories about the most famous families and biggest celebrities the world has ever seen. Our newest series is all about the royal spare Prince Harry. Stalked by grief and terrorized by the press, he grew up as the black sheep of the British royal family. But when he finally pushes through his stoic exterior and lets his feelings in, he'll have to make a choice he never thought he'd face. In our series, Prince Harry, Windsor of Change, we'll tell you how Harry discarded years of tradition to find the happiness he always craved. Follow Even the Rich on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Rich and Prince Harry, Windsor of Change early and ad-free right now on Wondery+. Plus.